dedication of the lane that has no turning section zero this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana the lane that has no turning and other tales concerning the people of pontiac by gilbert parker dedication to the right honourable sir wilfrid laurier g c m g dear sir wilfrid laurier since i first began to write these tales in eighteen ninety two i have had it in my mind to dedicate to you this bundle of life when it should be complete it seemed to me and it seems so still that to put your name upon the covering of my parcel as one should say in care of when it went forth was to secure its safe and considerate delivery to that public of the empire which is so much in your debt but with other feelings also do i dedicate this volume to yourself for many years your name has stood for a high and noble compromise between the temperaments and the intellectual and social habits of two races and i am not singular in thinking that you have done more than most other men to make the english and french of the dominion understand each other better there are somewhat awkward limits to true understanding as yet but that sympathetic service which you render to both peoples with a conscientious striving for impartiality tempers even the wind of party warfare to the shorn lamb of political opposition in a sincere sympathy with french life and character as exhibited in the democratic yet monarchical province of quebec or lower canada as historically i still love to think of it moved by friendly observation and seeking to be truthful and impartial have i made this book and others dealing with the life of the proud province which a century and a half of english governance has not anglicized this series of more or less connected stories however has been the most cherished of all my labours covering as it has done so many years and being the accepted of my anxious judgment out of a much larger gathering so many numbers of which are retired to the seclusion of copyright while reserved from publication in passing i need hardly say that the pontiac of this book is an imaginary place and has no association with the real pontiac of the province i had meant to call the volume born with a golden spoon a title stolen from the old phrase born with a golden spoon in the mouth but at the last moment i have given the book the name of the tale which is chronologically the climax of the series and the end of my narratives of french canadian life and character i had chosen the former title because of an inherent meaning in its relation to my subject a man born in the purple in comfort wealth and secure estate is said to have a golden spoon in his mouth in the eyes of the world however the phrase has a somewhat ironical suggestiveness and to have luxury wealth and place as a birthright is not thought to be the most fortunate incident of mortality my application of the phrase is therefore different i have as you know travelled far and wide during the past seventeen years and though i have seen people as frugal and industrious as the french canadians i have never seen frugality and industry associated with so much domestic virtue so much education and intelligence and so deep and simple a religious life nor have i ever seen a priesthood at once so devoted and high-minded in all that concerns the home life of their people as in french canada a land without poverty and yet without riches french canada stands alone too well educated to have a peasantry too poor to have an aristocracy as though in her the ancient prayer had been answered give me neither poverty nor riches but feed me with food convenient for me and it is of the habitant of quebec before all men else i should say born with the golden spoon in his mouth to you sir i come with this book which contains the first things i ever wrote out of the life of the province so dear to you and the last things also that i shall ever write about it i beg you to receive it as the loving recreation of one who sympathizes with the people of whom you come and honors their virtues and who has no fear for the unity and no doubt as to the splendid future of the nation whose fibre is got of the two great civilizing races of europe 
lastly you will know with what admiration and regard i place your name on the forepage of my book and greet in you the statesman the literateur and the personal friend believe me dear sir wilfrid laurier yours very sincerely gilbert parker twenty carlton house terrace london south west fourteenth august nineteen hundred end of section zero Section One of The Lane That Had No Turning. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Lane That Had No Turning and Other Tales Concerning the People of Pontiac by Gilbert Parker. The Lane That Had No Turning part one chapter one the return of madelinette his excellency the governor the english governor of french canada was come to pontiac accompanied by a goodly retinue by private secretary military secretary aide-de-camp cabinet minister and all that he was making a tour of the province but it was obvious that he had gone out of his way to visit pontiac for there were disquieting rumours in the air concerning the loyalty of the district indeed the governor had arrived but twenty-four hours after a meeting had been held under the presidency of the seigneur at which resolutions were presented easily translatable into sedition the cure and the avocat arriving in the nick of time had both spoken against these resolutions with the result that the new-born ardour in the minds of the simple habitants had died down and the seigneur had parted from the cure and the avocat in anger once before pontiac had been involved in an illegal demonstration valmond the bizarre but popular napoleonic pretender had raised his standard there the stones before the parish church had been stained with his blood and he lay in the churchyard of st saviour's forgiven and unforgotten how was it possible for pontiac to forget him had he not left his little fortune to the parish and had he not also left twenty thousand francs for the musical education of madelinette la jeunesse the daughter of the village forgeron to learn singing of the best masters in paris pontiac's wrong doings had brought it more profit than penalty more praise than punishment for after five years in france in the care of the little chemist's widow madelinette la jeunesse had become the greatest singer of her day but what had put the severest strain upon the modesty of pontiac was the fact that on the morrow of madelinette's first triumph in paris she had married monsieur louis racine the new seigneur of pontiac what more could pontiac wish it had been rewarded for its mistakes it had not even been chastened save that it was marked suspicious as to its loyalty at the headquarters of the english government in quebec it should have worn a crown of thorns but it flaunted a crown of roses a most unreasonable good fortune seemed to pursue it it had been led to expect that its new seigneur would be an englishman one george fournel to whom as the late seigneur had more than once declared the property had been left by will but at his death no will had been found and louis racine the direct heir in blood had succeeded to the property and the title brilliant enthusiastic fanatically french the new seigneur had set himself to revive certain old traditions customs and privileges of the seigneurial position 
he was reactionary seductive generous and at first he captivated the hearts of pontiac he did more than that he captivated madelinette la jeunesse in spite of her years in paris severe studious years which shut out the social world and the temptations of bohemian life madelinette retained a strange simplicity of heart and mind a desperate love for her old home which would not be gainsaid a passionate loyalty to her past which was an illusory attempt to arrest the inevitable changes that come with growth and with a sudden impulse she had sealed herself to her past at the very outset of her great career by marriage with louis racine on the very day of their marriage louis racine had made a painful discovery a heritage of his father's which had skipped two generations suddenly appeared in himself he was becoming a hunchback terror despair gloom anxiety had settled upon him three months later madelinette had gone to paris alone the seigneur had invented excuses for not accompanying her so she went instead in the care of the little chemist's widow as of old louis had promised to follow within another three months but he had not done so the surgical operation performed upon him was unsuccessful the strange growth increased sensitive fearful and morose he would not go to europe to be known as the hunchback husband of la jeunesse the great singer he dreaded the hour when madelinette and he should meet again a thousand times he pictured her as turning from him in loathing and contempt he had married her because he loved her but he knew well enough that ten thousand other men could love her just as well and be something more than a deformed seigneur of an obscure manor in quebec as his gloomy imagination pictured the future when madelinette should return and see him as he was and cease to love him to build up his seigneurial honour to an undue importance to give his position a fictitious splendour became a mania with him no ruler of a grand duchy ever cherished his honour dearer or exacted homage more persistently than did louis racine in the seigneury of pontiac coincident with the increase of these feudal extravagances was the increase of his fanatical patriotism which at last found vent in seditious writings agitations the purchase of rifles incitement to rebellion and the formation of an armed liveried troop of dependents at the manor on the very eve of the governor's coming despite the cure's and the avocat's warnings he had held a patriotic meeting intended to foster a stubborn if silent disregard of the governor's presence amongst them the speech of the cure who had given guarantee for the good behaviour of his people to the government had been so tinged with sorrowful appeal had recalled to them so acutely the foolish demonstration which had ended in the death of valmond that the people had turned from the exasperated seigneur with the fire of monomania in his eyes and had left him alone in the hall passionately protesting that the souls of frenchmen were not in them next day upon the church upon the louis quinn's hotel and elsewhere the union jack flew the british colours flaunted it in pontiac with welcome to the governor but upon the seigneury was another flag it of the golden lilies within the manor house m racine sat in the great seigneurial chair returned from the gates of death 
as he had come home from the feudal public meeting galloping through the streets and out upon the seigneury road in the dusk his horse had shied upon a bridge where mischievous lads waylaid travellers with ghostly heads made of lighted candles and hollowed pumpkins and horse and man had been plunged into the stream beneath his faithful servant Havel had seen the accident and dragged his insensible master from the water. Now the seigneur sat in the great armchair, glowering out upon the cheerful day. As he brooded, shaken and weak and bitter, all his thoughts were bitter now. A flash of scarlet, a glint of white plumes crossed his line of vision, disappeared, then again came into view, and horses' hoofs rang out on the hard road below. He started to his feet, but fell back again, so feeble was he, then rang the bell at his side with nervous insistence. A door opened quickly behind him, and his voice said imperiously, "'Quick, Havel, to the door. The governor and his suite have come. Call Tardif, and have wine and cake brought at once. When the governor enters, let Tardif stand at the door, and you beside my chair.' have the men-at-arms get into livery and make a guard of honour for the governor when he leaves their new rifles too and let old fathold wear his medal see that lucre is not filthy ha ha very good i must let the governor hear that quick quick havel they are entering the grounds let the manor bell be rung and every one mustered he shall see that to be a seigneur is not an empty honour i am something in the state something in my own right his lips moved restlessly he frowned his hands nervously clasped the arms of the chairs madelinette too shall see that i am to be reckoned with that i am not a nobody by god then but she shall see it he added bringing his clasped hand down hard upon the wood there was a stir outside a clanking of chains a champing of bits the murmurs of the crowd who were gathering fast in the grounds presently the door was thrown open and havel announced the governor louis racine got to his feet but the governor hastened forward and taking both his hands forced him gently back into the chair no no my dear seigneur you must not rise this is no state visit but a friendly call to offer congratulations on your happy escape and to inquire how you are the governor said his sentences easily but he suddenly flushed and was embarrassed for louis racine's deformity of which he had not known pontiac kept its troubles to itself stared him in the face and he felt the seigneur's eyes fastened on him with strange intensity i have to thank your excellency the seigneur said in a hasty nervous voice i fell on my shoulders that saved me if i had fallen on my head i should have been killed no doubt my shoulders saved me he added, with a petulant insistence in his voice, a morbid anxiety in his face. "'Most providential,' responded the governor. "'It grieves me that it should have happened on the occasion of my visit. I missed the seigneur's loyal public welcome. But I am happy,' he continued with smooth deliberation, "'to have it here in this old manor-house.' where other loyal french subjects of england have done honour to their sovereign's representative this place is sacred to hospitality and patriotism your excellency said louis racine nervousness passing from his voice and a curious hard look coming into his face the governor was determined not to see the double meaning it is a privilege to hear you say so i shall recall the fact to her majesty's government in the report i shall make upon my tour of the province i have a feeling that the queen's pleasure in the devotion of her distinguished french subjects may take some concrete forms the governor's suite 
looked at each other significantly for never before in his journeys had his excellency hinted so strongly that an honour might be conferred veiled as it was it was still patent as the sun spots of colour shot into the seigneur's cheeks an honour from the young english queen that would mate with madelinette's fame after all it was only his due he suddenly found it hard to be consistent his mind was in a whirl the governor continued it must have given you great pleasure to know that at windsor her majesty has given tokens of honour to the famous singer the wife of a notable french subject who while passionately eager to keep alive french sentiment has as we believe a deep loyalty to england the governor had said too much he had thought to give the seigneur an opportunity to recede from his seditious position there and then and to win his future loyalty monsieur racine's situation had peril and the governor had here shown him the way of escape but he had said one thing that drove louis racine mad he had given him unknown information about his own wife louis did not know that madelinette had been received by the queen or that she had received tokens of honour wild with resentment he saw in the governor's words a consideration for himself based only on the fact that he was the husband of the great singer he trembled to his feet at that moment there was a cheering outside great cheering but he did not heed it he was scarcely aware of it if it touched his understanding at all it only meant to him a demonstration in honour of the governor loyalty to the flag of england your excellency he said in a hoarse acrid voice you speak of loyalty to us whose lives for two centuries he paused for he heard a voice calling his name louis 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 the fierce words he had been about to utter died on his lips his eyes stared at the open window bewildered and even frightened louis louis now the voice was inside the house he stood trembling both hands grasping the arms of the chair every eye in the room was now turned towards the door as it opened the seigneur sank back in the chair a look of helpless misery touched by a fierce pride covering his face louis it was madelinette who disregarding the assembled company ran forward to him and caught both his hands in hers oh louis i have heard of your accident and she stopped suddenly short the governor turned away his head every person in the room did the same for as she bent over him she saw saw for the first time for the first time knew a look of horrified amazement of shrinking anguish crossed over her face he felt the lightning-like silence he knew that she had seen he struggled to his feet staring fiercely at her that one torturing instant had taken all the colour from her face but there was a strange brightness in her eyes a new power in her bearing she gently forced him into the seat again you are not strong enough louis you must be tranquil she turned now to the governor he made a sign to his suite who bowing slowly left the room permit me to welcome you to your native land again madam he said you have won for it a distinction it could never have earned and the world gives you many honours she was smiling and still and with one hand clasping her husband's she said the honour i value most my native land has given me i am lady of the manor here and wife of the seigneur racine agitated triumph came upon louis racine's face a weird painful vanity entered into him he stood up beside his wife as she turned and looked at him showing not a sign that what she saw disturbed her 
it is no mushroom honour to be seigneur of pontiac your excellency he said in a tone that jarred the barony is two hundred years old by rights granted from the crown of france i am baron of pontiac i think england has not yet recognised the title said the governor suggestively for he was here to make peace and in the presence of this man whose mental torture was extreme he would not allow himself to be irritated our baronies have never been recognised said the seigneur harshly and yet we are asked to love the flag of england and and to show that we are too proud to ask for a right that none can take away interposed madelinette graciously and eagerly as though to prevent louis from saying what he intended all at once she had had to order her life anew to replace old thoughts by new ones we honour and obey the rulers of our land and fly the english flag and welcome the english governor gladly when he comes to us will your excellency have some refreshment she added quickly for she saw the cloud on the seigneur's brow louis she continued will you i have ordered refreshment said the seigneur excitedly the storm passing from his face however havel tardif where are you fellows he stamped his foot imperiously havel entered with a tray of wine and glasses followed by tardif loaded with cakes and comfits and set them on the table ten minutes later the governor took his leave at the front door he stopped surprised for a guard of honour of twenty men were drawn up he turned to the seigneur what soldiers are these he asked the seigneury company your excellency replied louis what uniform is it they wear he asked in an even tone but a black look in his eye which did not escape madelinette the livery of the barony of pontiac answered the seigneur the governor looked at them a moment without speaking it is french uniform of the time of louis quinze he said picturesque but informal he added he went over and taking a carbine from one of the men examined it your carbines are not so unconventional and antique he said meaningly and with a frosty smile the compromise of the centuries hein he said to the cure who with the avocat was now looking on with some trepidation i am wondering if it is quite legal it is charming to have such a guard of honour but i am wondering wondering a eh, monsieur l'avocat is it legal the avocat made no reply for the cure's face was greatly troubled the seigneur's momentary placidity passed i answer for their legality your excellency he said in a high assertive voice of course of course you will answer for it said the governor smiling enigmatically he came suddenly forward and held out his hand to madelinette madam i shall remember your kindness and i appreciate the simple honours done me here your arrival at the moment of my visit is a happy circumstance there was a meaning in his eye not in his voice which went straight to madelinette's understanding she murmured something in reply and a moment afterwards the governor his suite and the crowd were gone and the men-at-arms the fantastic body of men in their antique livery armed with the latest modern weapons had gone back to civic life again inside the house once more madelinette laid her hand upon louis's arm with a smile that wholly deceived him for a moment he thought now that she must have known of his deformity before she came the world was so full of tale-bearers and had long since maybe reconciled herself to the painful fact she had shown no surprise no shrinking there had been only the one lightning instant in which he had felt a kind of suspension of her breath and being but when he had looked her in the face she was composed and smiling after all his frightened anticipation the great moment had come and gone without tragedy with satisfaction he looked in the mirror in the hall as they passed inside the house he saw no reason to quarrel with his face 
was it possible that the deformity did not matter after all he felt madeline's hand on his arm he turned and clasped her to his breast he did not notice that she kept her hands under her chin as he drew her to him that she did not as had been her wont put them on his shoulders he did not feel her shrink and no one seeing could have said that she shrank from him in ever so little how beautiful you are he said as he looked into her face how glad i am to be here again and how tired i am louis she said i've driven thirty miles since daylight she disengaged herself i'm going to sleep now she added i'm going to turn the key in my door till evening please tell madame marie so louis inside her room alone she flung herself on her bed in agony and despair louis oh my god she cried and sobbed and sobbed her strength away chapter two when the red coats came a month later there was a sale of the household effects the horses and general possessions of medallion the auctioneer who though a protestant and an englishman had by his wits and goodness of heart endeared himself to the parish therefore the notables among the habitants had gathered in his empty house for a last drink of good fellowship muroc the charcoal man duclos the meal man benoit the ne'er-do-weel gingras the one-eyed shoemaker and a few others they had drunk the health of medallion they had drunk the health of the cure and now duclos the meal man raised his glass here's to wait a minute porridge pot cried muroc the best man here should raise the glass first and say the votre sante tis monsieur medallion should speak and sip now medallion was half sitting on the window-sill abstractedly listening he had been thinking that his ships were burned behind him and that in middle age he was starting out to make another camp for himself in the world all because of the new seigneur of pontiac time was when he had been successful here but louis racine had changed all that his hand was against the english and he had brought a french auctioneer to pontiac medallion might have divided the parish as to patronage but he had other views so he was going madelinette had urged him to stay but he had replied that it was too late the harm was not to be undone as muroc spoke every one turned toward medallion he came over and filled a glass at the table and raised it i drink to madelinette daughter of that fine old puffing forgeron la Genousse, he added as the big blacksmith now entered the room la Genousse grinned and ducked his head i knew madelinette as did you all when i could take her on my knee and tell her english stories and listen to her sing french chansons the best in the world she has gone on we stay where we are but she proves her love to us by taking her husband from pontiac and coming back to us may she never find a spot so good to come to and so hard to leave as pontiac he drank and they all did the same draining his glass medallion let it fall on the stone floor it broke into a hundred pieces he came and shook hands with la Genousse. give her my love he said tell her the highest bidder on earth could not buy one of the kisses she gave me when she was five and i was thirty then he shook hands with them all and went into the next room why did he drop his glass asked gingras the shoemaker that's the way of the aristocrats when it's the damnedest toast that ever was said duclos the mealman eh la Genouse, that's so isn't it what the devil do i know about aristocrats said la Genouse. you're among the best of the land now that madelinette's married to the seigneur you ought to wear a paper collar every day bah answered the blacksmith i'm only old la Genouse, the blacksmith though she's my girl my lads 
i was joe lajeunesse yesterday and i'll be joe lajeunesse to-morrow and i'll die joe lajeunesse the forgeron bagosh so you take me as you find me monsieur racine doesn't marry me and madelinette doesn't take me to paris and lead me round the stage and say this is monsieur lajeunesse my father no nope, i'm myself and a damn good blacksmith and nothing else am i tut tut old leather belly said gingras the shoemaker whose liquor had mounted high you'll not need to work now madelinette's got double fortune she gets thousands for a song and she's lady of the manor here what's too good for you tell me that my forgeron not working between meals that's too good for me gingras i'm here to earn my bread with the hands i was born with and to eat what they earn and live by it let a man live according to his gifts bagosh till i'm sent for that's what i'll do and when time's up i'll take my hand off the bellows and my leather apron can go to you gingras for boots for a bigger fool than me there's only one said benoit the ne'er-do-weel who had been to college as a boy who's that said muroc you wouldn't know his name he's trying to find eggs in last year's nest answered benoit with a leer he means the seigneur said muroc look to your son-in-law lajeunesse he's kicking up a dust that'll choke pontiac yet it's as if there was an imp in him driving him on we've had enough of the devil's dust here said lajeunesse has he been talking to you muroc muroc nodded treason or thereabouts once with him that's dead in the graveyard yonder it was france we were to save and bring back the napoleons i have my sword yet now it's save quebec i it's stand alone and have our own flag and shout and fight maybe to be free of england independence that's it one by one the english have had to go from pontiac now it's monsieur medallion there's shandon the irishman gone too monsieur sold him up and shipped him off said gingras the shoemaker tiens the seigneur gave him fifty dollars when he left to help him along he smacks and then kisses does monsieur racine we've to pay tribute to the seigneur every year as they did in the days of vaudreuil and louis the saint said duclos i've got my notice a bag of meal under the big tree at the manor door i've to bring a pullet and a bag of charcoal said muroc tis the rights of the seigneur as of old tiens it is my mind said benoit that a man that nature twists in back or leg or body anywhere gets a twist in his brain too there's parpon the dwarf god knows parpon is a nut to crack but parpon isn't married to the greatest singer in the world though she's the only daughter of old leatherbelly there said gingras something doesn't come of nothing snub nose said lajeunesse mark you i was born a man of fame walking bloody paths to glory but by the grace of heaven and my baptism i became a forgeron let others ride to glory i'll shoe their horses for the gallop you'll be in parliament yet lajeunesse said duclos the mealman who had been dozing on a pile of untired cartwheels i'll be hanged first comrade one in the family at a time said muroc there's the seigneur he's going into parliament he's a magistrate that's enough said duclos he started the court under the big tree as the seigneur did two hundred years ago he'll want to give it on a gallows next i should think he'd stay at home and not take any more on his shoulders said the one-eyed shoemaker without a word lajeunesse threw a dish of water in gingras face this reference to the seigneur's deformity was unpalatable gingras had not recovered from his discomfiture when all were startled by the distant blare of a bugle they rushed to the door and were met by parpon the dwarf who announced that a regiment of soldiers was marching on the village tis what i expected after that meeting and the governor's visit and the lily flag of france on the manor and the bodyguard and the carbines said muroc nervously we're all in trouble again sure said benoit who drained his glass to the last drop some of us will go to jail 
the coming of the militia had been wholly unexpected by the people of pontiac but the cause was not far to seek ever since the governor's visit there had been sinister rumours abroad concerning louis racine which the cure and the avocat and the others had taken pains to contradict it was known that the seigneur had been requested to disband his so-called company of soldiers with their ancient livery and their modern arms and to give them up he had disbanded the corps but he had not given up the arms and for reasons unknown the government had not pressed the point so far as the world knew but it had decided to hold a district drill in this far-off portion of the province and this summer morning two thousand men marched upon the town and through it horse foot and commissariat and pontiac was aroused out of the last century romance the seigneur had sought to continue to face the actual presence of modern force and the machinery of war twice before had british soldiers marched into the town the last time but a few years agone when blood had been shed on the stones in front of the parish church but here were large numbers of well-armed men from the eastern parishes english and french with four hundred regulars to leaven the mass la Junasse knew only too well what this demonstration meant before the last soldier had passed through the street he was on his way to the seigneury he found madelinette alone in the great dining-room mending a rent in the british flag which she was preparing for a flagstaff when she saw him she dropped the flag as if startled came quickly to him took both his hands in hers and kissed his cheek wonder of wonders she said it's these soldiers he replied shortly what of them she asked brightly do you mean to say you don't know what their coming here means he asked they must drill somewhere and they are honouring pontiac she replied gaily but her face flushed as she bent over the flag again he came and stood in front of her i don't know what's in your mind i don't know what you mean to do but i do know that monsieur racine is making trouble here and out of it you'll come more hurt than anybody what has louis done what has he done he's been stirring up feeling against the british what has he done look at the silly customs he's got out of old coffins to make us believe they're alive why did he ever try to marry you why did you ever marry him you are the great singer of the world he's a mad hunchback habitant seigneur she stamped her foot indignantly but presently she ruled herself to composure and said quietly he is my husband he is a brave man with foolish dreams then with a sudden burst of tender feeling oh father father can't you see i loved him that is why i married him you ask me what i am going to do i am going to give the rest of my life to him i am going to stay with him and be to him all that he may never have in this world never never i am going to be to him what my mother was to you a slave to the end a slave who loved you and who gave you a daughter who will do the same for her husband no matter what he does or is eh no matter what he is la Jeunesse gasped you will give up singing not sing again before kings and courts and not earn ten thousand dollars a month more than i've earned in twenty years you don't mean that madelinette he was hoarse with feeling and held out his hand pleadingly to him it seemed that his daughter was mad that she was throwing her life away i mean that father she answered quietly there are things worth more than money you don't mean to say that you can love him as he is it isn't natural but no it isn't what would you have said if any one had asked you if you loved my mother that last year of her life when she was a cripple and we wheeled her about in a chair you made for her don't say any more he said slowly and took up his hat and kept turning it round in his hand but you'll prevent him getting into trouble with the government he urged at last i have done what i could 
she answered then with a little gasp they came to arrest him a fortnight ago but i said they should not enter the house havel and i prevented them refused to let them enter the men did not know what to do and so they went back and now this she pointed to where the soldiers were pitching their tents in the valley below since then louis has done nothing to give trouble he only writes in dreams if he would but dream and no more she added half under her breath we've dreamt too much in pontiac already said la jeunesse shaking his head madelinette reached up her hand and laid it on his shaggy black hair you are a good little father big smithy man she said lovingly you make me think of the strong men in the nibelungen legends it must be a big horse that will take you to Valhalla with the heroes she added such notions there in your head he laughed try to frighten me with your big names hein there was a new look in the face of father and of daughter no mist or cloud was between them the things they had long wished to say were uttered at last a new faith was established between them since her return they had laughed and talked as of old when they had met though her own heart was aching and he was bitter against the seigneur she had kept him and the whole parish in good humour by her unconventional ways as though people were not as though people were not beginning to make pilgrimages to pontiac to see her people who stared at the name over the blacksmith's door and eyed her curiously or lay in wait about the seigneury that they might get a glimpse of madame and her deformed husband out in the world where she was now so important the newspapers told strange romantic tales of the great singer wove wild and wonderful legends of her life to her it did not matter if she knew she did not heed if she heeded it even in her heart she showed nothing of it before the world she knew that soon there would be wilder tales still when it was announced that she was bidding farewell to the great working world and would live on in retirement she had made up her mind quite how the announcement should read and once it was given out nothing would induce her to change her mind her life was now the life of the seigneur a struggle in her heart went on but she fought it down the lure of a great temptation from that far-off outside world was before her but she had resolved her heart against it in his rough but tender way her father now understood and that was a comfort to her he felt what he could not reason upon or put in adequate words but the confidence made him happy and his eyes said so to her now see big smithy man she said gaily soon will be the fete of saint jean baptiste and we shall all be happy then louis has promised to make a speech that will not be against the english but only words which will tell how dear the old land is to us ten to one against it said la jeunesse anxiously then he brightened as he saw a shadow cross her face but you can make him do anything as you always made me he added shaking his tousled head and taking with a droll eagerness the glass of wine she offered him end of section one section two of the lane that had no turning this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Lane That Had No Turning and Other Tales Concerning the People of Pontiac by Gilbert Parker. The Lane That Had No Turning, Part Two. Chapter Three man to man and steel to steel one evening a fortnight later louis racine and george fournel the englishman stood face to face in the library of the manor house there was antagonism and animosity in the attitude of both 
apart from the fact that louis had succeeded to the seigneury promised to fournel and sealed to him by a reputed will which had never been found there was cause for hatred on the englishman's part fournel had been an incredibly successful man things had come his way wealth and the power that wealth brings he had but two setbacks and the man before him in the manor house of pontiac was the cause of both the last rebuff had been the succession to the seigneury which curious as it might seem had been the cherished dream of the rich man's retirement it had been his fancy to play the seigneur the lord magnificent and bountiful and he had determined to use wealth and all manner of influence to have the title of baron pontiac revived it had been obsolete for a hundred years he leaned towards the grace of a hereditary dignity as other retired millionaires cultivate art and letters vainly imagining that they can wheedle civilization and the humanities into giving them what they do not possess by nature and fool the world at the same time the loss of the seigneury had therefore cut deep but there had been a more hateful affront still four years before louis racine when spasmodically practising law in quebec had been approached by two poor frenchmen who laid claim to thousands of acres of land which a land company whereof george fournel was president was publicly exploiting for the woods and valuable minerals discovered on it the land company had been composed of englishmen only louis racine reactionary and imaginative brilliant and free from sordidness and openly hating the english had taken up the case and for two years fought it tooth and nail without pay or reward the matter had become a cause celeb the land company engaging the greatest lawyers in both the english and french provinces in the supreme court the case was lost to louis's clients he took it over to the privy council in london and carried it through triumphantly and alone proving his client's title his two poor frenchmen regained their land in payment he would accept nothing save the ordinary fees as though it were some petty case in a county court he had however made a reputation which he had seemed not to value save as a means of showing hostility to the governing race and the seigneury of pontiac when it fell to him had more charms for him than any celebrity to be won at the bar his love of the history of his country was a mania with him and he looked forward on arriving at pontiac to being the apostle of french independence on the continent madelinette had crossed his path in his most enthusiastic moment when his brilliant tongue and great dreams surrounded him with a kind of glamour he had caught her to himself out of the girl's first triumph when her nature tried by the strain of her first challenge to the judgment of the world cried out for rest for pontiac and home and all that was of the old life among her people fournel's antipathy had only been increased by the fact that louis racine had married the now famous madelinette and his animosity extended to her it was not in him to understand the nature of the frenchman volatile moody chivalrous unreasonable the slave of ideas the victim of sentiment not understanding when he began to see that he could not attain the object of his visit which was to secure some relics of the late seigneur's household he chose to be disdainful you are bound to give me these things i ask for as a matter of justice if you know what justice means he said at last you should be aware of that answered the seigneur with a kindling look he felt every glance of fournel's eye a contemptuous comment upon his deformity now so egregious and humiliating i taught you justice once fournel was not to be moved from his phlegm he knew he could torture the man before him and he was determined to do so if he did not get his way upon the matter of his visit you can teach me justice twice and be thanked once 
he answered these things i asked for were much prized by my friend the late seigneur i was led to expect that this seigneury and all in it and on it should be mine i know it was intended so the law gives it to you instead your technical claim has overridden my rights you have a gift for making successful technical claims but these old personal relics of no monetary value you can waive your avaricious and indelicate claim to them he added the last words with a malicious smile for the hardening look in racine's face told him his request was hopeless and he could not resist the temptation to put the matter with cutting force racine rose to the bait with a jump not one single thing not one single solitary thing the sentiment is strong if the grammar is bad interrupted fournel meaning to wound wherever he found an opportunity for the seigneur's deformity excited in him no pity it rather incensed him against the man as an affront to decency and to his own just claims to the honours the frenchman enjoyed it was a petty resentment but george fournel had set his heart upon playing the grand seigneur over the frenchman of pontiac and of ultimately leaving his fortune to the parish if they all fell down and worshipped him and his golden calf the grammar is suitable to the case retorted the seigneur his voice rising everything is mine by law and everything i will keep if you think different produce a will produce a will truth was louis racine would rather have parted with the seigneury itself than with these relics asked for they were reminiscent of the time when france and her golden lilies brooded over his land of the days when louis quatorze was king he cherished everything that had association with days of the old regime as a miser hugs his gold or a woman her jewels the request to give them up to this unsympathetic englishman who valued them because they had belonged to his friend the late seigneur only exasperated him i am ready to pay the highest possible price for them as i have said urged the englishman realizing as he spoke that it was futile to urge the sale upon that basis money cannot buy the things that frenchmen love we are not a race of hucksters retorted the seigneur that accounts for your envious dispositions then you can't buy what you want you love such curious things i assume so you play the dog in the manger and won't let other decent folk buy what they want he wilfully distorted the other's meaning and was delighted to see the seigneur's fingers twitch with fury but since you can't buy the things you love and you seem to think you should how do you get them do you come by them honestly or do you work miracles when a spider makes love to his lady he dances before her to infatuate her and then in a moment of her delighted aberration snatches at her affections it is the way of the spider then with a snarl as of a wild beast louis racine sprang forward and struck fournel in the face with his clenched fist then as fournel blinded staggered back upon the bookshelves he snatched two antique swords from the wall throwing one on the floor in front of the englishman he ran to the door and locked it and turned round the sword grasped firmly in his hand and white with rage spider spider by heaven you shall have the spider dance before you he said hoarsely he had mistaken fournel's meaning he had put the most horrible construction upon it he thought that fournel referred to his deformity and had ruthlessly dragged in madelinette as well he was like a being distraught his long brown hair was tossed over his blanched forehead and piercing black eyes his head was thrown forward even more than his deformity compelled his white teeth showed in a grimace of hatred he was half crouched like an animal ready to spring take up the sword or i'll run you through the heart where you stand he continued in a hoarse whisper i will give you till i can count three then by the god in heaven 
fournel felt that he had to deal with a man demented the blow he had received had laid open the flesh on his cheekbone and blood was flowing from the wound never in his life before had he been so humiliated and by a frenchman it roused every instinct of race hatred in him yet he wanted not to go at him with a sword but with his two honest hands and beat him into a whining submission but the man was deformed he had none of his own robust strength he was not to be struck but to be tossed out of the way like an offending child he staunched the blood from his face and made a step forward without a word determined not to fight but to take the weapon from the other's hands coward said the seigneur you dare not fight with the sword with the sword we are even i am as strong as you there stronger and i will have your blood coward 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 i will give you till i count three one two fournel did not stir he could not make up his mind what to do cry out no one could come in time to prevent the onslaught and onslaught there would be he knew there was a merciless hatred in the seigneur's face a deadly purpose in his eyes the wild determination of a man who did not care whether he lived or died ready to throw himself upon a hundred in his hungry rage it seemed so wild so monstrous that the beautiful summer day through which came the sharp wetting of the scythe the song of the birds and the smell of ripening fruit and grain should be invaded by this tragic absurdity this human fury which must spend itself in blood fournel's mind was conscious of this feeling this sense of futile foolish waste and disfigurement even as the seigneur said three and rushing forward thrust as fournel saw the blade spring at him he dropped on one knee caught it with his left hand as it came and wrenched it aside the blade lacerated his fingers and his palm but he did not let go till he had seized the sword at his feet with his right hand then springing up with it he stepped back quickly and grasped his weapon fiercely enough now yet enraged as he was he had no wish to fight to involve himself in a fracas which might end in tragedy and the courts of the land it was a high price to pay for any satisfaction he might have in this affair if the seigneur were killed in the encounter he must defend himself now what a miserable notoriety and possible legal penalty and public punishment for who could vouch for the truth of his story even if he wounded racine only what a wretched story to go abroad that he had fought with a hunchback a hunchback who knew the use of the sword which he did not but still a hunchback stop this nonsense he said as louis racine prepared to attack again don't be a fool the game isn't worth the candle one of us does not leave this room alive said the seigneur you care for life you love it and you can't buy what you love from me i don't care for life and i would gladly die to see your blood flow look it's flowing down your face it's dripping from your hand and there shall be more dripping soon on guard he suddenly attacked with fierce energy forcing fournel back upon the wall he was not a first-class swordsman but he had far more knowledge of the weapon than his opponent and he had no scruple about using his knowledge fournel fought with desperate alertness yet awkwardly and he could not attack it was all that he could do all that he knew how to do to defend himself twice again did the seigneur's weapon draw blood once from the shoulder and once from the leg of his opponent and the blood was flowing from each wound after the second injury they stood panting for a moment now the outside world was shut out from fournel's senses as it was from louis racine's the only world they knew was this cool room whose oak floors were browned by the slow searching stains of time and darkened by the footsteps of six generations that had come and gone through the old house the books along the walls seemed to cry out against the unseemly and unholy strife 
but now both men were in that atmosphere of supreme egoism where only their two selves moved and where the only thing that mattered on earth was the issue of this strife fournel could only think of how to save his life and to do that he must become the aggressor for his wounds were bleeding hard and he must have more wounds if the fight went on without harm to the seigneur you know now what it is to insult a frenchman on guard again cried the seigneur in a shriller voice for everything in him was pitched to the highest note he again attacked and the sound of the large swords meeting clashed on the soft air as they struggled a voice came ringing through the passages singing a bar from an opera o oh, eager golden day o oh, happy evening hour behold my lover cometh from fields of wrath and hate sheathed is his sword he cometh to my bower in war he findeth honour and love within the gate the voice came nearer and nearer it pierced the tragic separateness of the scene of blood it reached the ears of the seigneur and a look of pain shot across his face for now was only dimly aware of the voice for he was hard pressed and it seemed to come from infinite distances presently the voice stopped and someone tried the door of the room it was madelinette astonished at finding it locked she stood still a moment uncertain what to do then the sounds of the struggle within came to her ears she shook the door leaned her shoulders against it and called louis louis suddenly she darted away found havel the faithful servant in the passage and brought him swiftly to the door the man sprang upon it striking with his shoulder the lock gave the door flew open and madelinette stepped swiftly into the room in time to see george fournel sway and fall his sword rattling on the hard oak floor oh what have you done louis she cried then added hurriedly to havel draw the blind there shut the door and tell madame marie to bring some water quickly the silent servant vanished and she dropped on her knees beside the bleeding and insensible man and lifted his head he insulted you and me and i've killed him madelinette said louis hoarsely a horrified look came to her face and she hurriedly and tremblingly opened fournel's waistcoat and shirt and felt his heart she was freshly startled by a struggle behind her and turning quickly she saw madame marie holding the seigneur's arm to prevent him from ending his own life she sprang up and laid her hand upon her husband's arm he is not dead you need not do it louis she said quietly there was no alarm no undue excitement in her face now she was acting with good presence of mind a new sense was working in her something had gone from her suddenly where her husband was concerned and something else had taken its place an infinite pity a bitter sorrow and a gentle command were in her eyes all at once new vistas of life opened before her all in an instant he is not dead and there is no need to kill yourself louis she repeated and her voice had a command in it that was not to be gainsaid since you have vindicated your honour you will now help me to set this business right madame marie was on her knees beside the insensible man no he is not dead thank god she murmured and while havel stripped the arm and leg she poured some water between fournel's lips her long experience as the little chemist's wife served her well now now that the excitement was over louis collapsed he swayed and would have fallen but madelinette caught him helped him to the sofa and forcing him gently down on his side adjusted a pillow for him and turned to the wounded man again an hour went busily by in the closely curtained room and at last george fournel conscious and with wounds well bandaged sat in a big armchair glowering round him at his first coming to louis racine at his wife's insistence had come and offered his hand and made apology for assaulting him in his own house 
Fournel's reply had been that he wanted to hear no more fool's talk and to have no more fool's doings, and that one day he hoped to take his pay for the day's business in a satisfactory way. Madelinette made no apology, said nothing, save that she hoped he would remain for a few days, till he was recovered enough to be moved. He replied that he would leave as soon as his horses were ready, and refused to take food or drink from their hands. His servant was brought from the Louis Quince Hotel, and through him he got what was needed for refreshment, and requested that no one of the household should come near him. At night, in the darkness, he took his departure, no servant of the household in attendance. But as he got into the carriage, Madelinette came quickly to him and said, I would give ten years of my life to undo today's work. I have no quarrel with you, madam, he said gloomily, raised his hat, and was driven away. Chapter 4 Madelinette Makes a Discovery The national fate of the summer was over. The day had been successful more successful indeed than any within the memory of the inhabitants for the english and french soldiers joined in the festivities without any intrusion of racial spirit but in the very essence and soul of good fellowship the general had called at the manor had paid his respects to the seigneur who received him abstractedly if not coolly but madelinette had captured his imagination and his sympathies he was fond of music for an Englishman, and with a ravishing charm she sang for him a bergeret of the eighteenth century, and then a ballad of Shakespeare's set to her own music. She was so anxious that the great holiday should pass off without one untoward incident, that she would have resorted to any fair device to attain the desired end. The general could help her by his influence and instructions, and if the soldiers— regulars and militia joined in the celebrations harmoniously and with good will a long step would be made towards undoing the harm that louis had done and maybe influencing him towards a saner wiser view of things he had changed much since the fateful day when he had forced george fournel to fight him had grown more silent and had turned grey his eyes had become by turns watchful and suspicious, gloomy and abstracted, and his speech knew the same variations, now bitter and cynical, now sad and distant, and all the time his eyes seemed to grow darker and his face paler. But however moody and variable and irascible he might be with others, however unappeasable, with Madelinette he struggled to be gentle and his petulance gave way under the intangible persuasiveness of her words and will which had the effect of command under this influence he had prepared the words which he was to deliver at the fete they were full of veneration for past traditions but were not at variance with a proper loyalty to the flag under which they lived and if the english soldiery met the speech with genial appreciation the day might end in a blessing and surely blessings were overdue in madelinette's life in pontiac it had been as she worked for and desired thanks to herself and the english general's sympathetic help perhaps his love of music made him better understand what she wanted made him even forgiving of the seigneur's strained manner but certain it is that the day begun with uneasiness on the part of the people of pontiac who felt themselves under surveillance ended in great good feeling and harmless revelry and it was also certain that the seigneur's speech gained him an applause that surprised him and momentarily appeased his vanity the general gave him a guard of honour of the french militia in keeping with his position as seigneur and this with madelinette's presence at his elbow restrained him in his speech when he would have broken from the limits of propriety in the intoxication of his eager eloquence but he spoke with moderation standing under the british flag on the platform and at the last he said a flag not our own floats over us now 
guarantees us against the malice of the world and assures us in our laws and religion but there is another flag which in our tearful memories is as dear to us now as it was at carillon and levis it is the flag of memory of language and of race the emblem of our past upon our hearthstones and the great country that rules us does not deny us reverence to it seeing it we see the history of our race from charlemagne to this day and we have a pride in that history which england does not rebuke a pride which is just and right it is fitting that we should have a day of commemoration far off in france burns the light our fathers saw and were glad of and we in pontiac have a link that binds us to the old home we have ever given her proud remembrance we now give her art and song with these words and turning to his wife he ended and cries of madame madelinette madame madelinette were heard everywhere even the english soldiers cheered and madelinette sang a la claire fontaine three verses in french and one in english and the whole valley rang with the refrain sung at the topmost pitch by five thousand voices il y a l'encant que je t'aime je me gêne tublure the day of pleasure done and dusk settled on pontiac and on the encampment of soldiers in the valley a light still burned in the library at the manor house long after midnight madelinette had gone to bed but excited by the events of the day she could not sleep and she went down to the library to read but her mind wandered still and she sat mechanically looking before her at a picture of the father of the late seigneur which was let into the moulding of the oak wall as she looked abstractedly and yet with the intensity of the preoccupied mind her eye became aware of a little piece of wood let into the moulding of the frame the light of the hanging lamp was full on it this irregularity began to perplex her eye presently it intruded on her reverie still busy with her thoughts she knelt upon the table beneath the picture and pressed the irregular piece of wood a spring gave the picture came slowly away from the frame and disclosed a small cupboard behind in this cupboard were a few books an old silver-handed pistol, and a packet. Madelinette's reverie was broken now. She was face to face with discovery and mystery. Her heart stood still with fear. After an instant of suspense, she took out the packet and held it to the light. She gave a smothered cry. It was the will of the late seigneur. Chapter 5 what will she do with it george fournel was the heir to the seigneury of pontiac not louis racine there it was in the will of monsieur de la riviere duly signed and attested madeline's heart stood still louis was no longer indeed never had been seigneur of pontiac and they had no right there had never had any right there they must leave this place which was to louis the fetish of his soul the small compensation fate had made him for the trouble nature had cynically laid upon him he had clung to it as a drowning man clings to a spar to him it was the charter from which he could appeal to the world as the husband of madelinette lajeunesse to him it was the name the dignity and the fortune he brought her it was the one thing that saved him from a dire humiliation it was the vantage ground from which he appealed to her respect the flaming testimony of his own self-esteem every hour since his trouble had come upon him since madelinette's great fame had come to her he had protested to himself that it was honour for honour and every day he had laboured sometimes how fantastically how futilely to dignify his position to enhance his importance in her eyes she had understood it all had read him to the last letter in the alphabet of his mind and heart 
she had realized the consternation of the people and she knew that for her sake and because the cure had commanded all the obsolete claims he had made were responded to by the people certainly he had affected them by his eloquence and his fiery kindness but at the same time they had shrewdly smelt the trees and underneath his ardour there was a definite limit to their loyalty to him and deprived of the seigneury he would count for nothing a hundred thoughts like these went through her mind as she stood by the table under the hanging lamp her face white as the loose robe she wore her eyes hot and staring her figure rigid as stone to-morrow how could she face to-morrow and louis how could she tell him this how could she say to him louis you are no longer seigneur the man you hate he who is your inveterate enemy who has every reason to exact from you the last tribute of humiliation is seigneur here how could she face the despair of the man whose life was one inward fever one long illusion which was yet only half an illusion since he was forever tortured by suspicion whose body was wearing itself out and whose spirit was destroying itself in the struggle of a vexed imagination she knew that louis's years were numbered she knew that this blow would break him body and soul he could never survive the humiliation his sensitiveness was a disease his pride was the only thing that kept him going his love of her strong as it was would be drowned in an imagined shame it was midnight she was alone with this secret she held the paper in her hand which was at once louis's sentence or his charter of liberty a candle was at her hand the doors were shut the blinds drawn the house a frozen silence how cold she was though it was the deep of summer she shivered from head to foot and yet all day the harvest sun had drenched the room in its heat yet her blood might run warm again her cold cheeks might regain their colour her heart beat quietly if this paper were no more the thought made her shrink away from herself as it were yet she caught up the candle and lighted it for louis for louis though she would rather have died than do it for herself to save to louis what was to his imagination the one claim he had upon her respect and the world's after all how little was it in value or in dignity how little she cared for it one year of her voice could earn two such seigneuries as this and the honour save that it was pontiac it was not to her in all her life she had never done or said a dishonourable thing she had never lied she had never deceived she had never done aught that might not have been written down and published to all the world yet here all at once she was faced with a vast temptation to do a deed the penalty of which was an indelible shame what injury would it do to george fournel he was used now to his disappointment he was rich he had no claims upon pontiac there was no one but himself to whom it mattered this little seigneury what he did not know did not exist so far as himself was concerned how easily could it all be made right some day she felt as though she were suffocating and she opened the window a little very softly then she lit the candle tremblingly watched the flame gather strength and opened out the will as she did so however the smell of a buckwheat field which is as honey came stealing through the room and all at once a strange association of ideas flashed into her brain she recalled one summer day long ago when in the church of st saviour's the smell of the buckwheat fields came through the open door and windows and her mind had kept repeating mechanically till she fell asleep the text of the cure's sermon as ye sow so also shall ye reap that placid hour which had no problems no cares no fears 
no penalties in view which was filled with the richness of a blessed harvest and the plentitude of innocent youth came back on her now in the moment of her fierce temptation she folded up the paper slowly a sob came in her throat she blew out the candle and put the will back in the cupboard the faint click of the spring as she closed the panel seemed terribly loud to her she started and looked timorously round the blood came back to her face she flushed crimson with guilt then she turned out the lighted lamp and crept away up the stairs to her room she paused beside louis's bed he was moving restlessly in his sleep he was murmuring her name with a breaking sigh she crept into bed slowly and lay like one who had been beaten bruised and shamed at last before the dawn she fell asleep she dreamed that she was in prison and that george fournel was her jailer she waked to find louis at her bedside i am holding my seigneurial court to-day he said end of section two